Hello, this is Valdemar Janusczak, art critic, producer and presenter of documentaries. Thanks for watching Perspective, YouTube's home for classical art. Tracy Emin is one of the leading lights of British art today. She's one of the big figures, there's no question about her. She's one of the most compelling figures, and her work is incredibly charismatic. My sister makes her own rod for her own back, being Tracy Emin, the weird, wacky artist. She's out to shock people, to make a name for herself in one night. She's a big national British institution like Morecambe and Wise or Quentin Crisp. But she either is kind of a genius and a wonderful thing and an extraordinary thing, or too much of a chancer or a fake or a loser. Being an artist, you have to have an ego. And for me, sexuality is part of my ego. People say that my work's tediously narcissistic, and I, but then those people don't like me. They don't like what I stand for. They don't like my accent. They don't like my attitude. And guess what? I'm not making my work for them anyway. I have really good ideas when I'm feeling sexy. I'm talking about an inner feeling. I'm talking about how your blood moves around your body, how your eyes might twinkle, how your mouth might slightly smirk when people say things or whatever, how your hair may feel. I mean, Christ, it's all, we came from sex, didn't we? We came from love. So why not be able to use that as a vehicle of expression? She makes these wonderfully edgy, vulnerable, childlike drawings, which one can buy a unique drawing of Tracy Emmons for between, you know, 1,500 and 3,000 pounds, depending on the size of it. And uh, yet she then makes sculptures, she makes films, she makes, she does performances. So you have an extremely eclectic output. She's just recently had a hugely successful show in New York with um, work selling up to 35,000 pounds. And yet there is the central issue that is Tracy Emin. Her work is about herself and her work comes from her personal experiences. The, the first thing that really impressed me was the video of her that she ends up dancing where she talks about, you know, her life in Margate and being teased because she was uh, exploring her early sexuality. By the time I was 15, I'd stopped shagging, but I was still flesh. And I thought with my body, but now it was different. Now it was me and dancing. Then the big one came, the local finals. And as I started to dance, people started to clap. I was going to win. And then they started. Slag, slag, slag. A gang of blokes, most of whom I'd had sex with at some time or other, were chanting, slag. Until in the end, I couldn't hear the music anymore. All the people clapping. My head was spinning and I was crying. I'd lost it. I ran off the dance floor, out of the club, down the steps to the sea. And I thought, I'm leaving this place. I'm getting out of here. I'm better than all of them. I'm free. And I left Margate and I left those boys. Shane, Eddie, Tony, Doug, Richard. This one's for you.
I've always liked her work because, you know, real art to me is primarily about emotions and there's very few artists that express them as clearly and as succinctly and as bravely as Tracy. And she's quite a handful. And, you know, she's like demanding and manipulative and all of those things. But at the same time, I think her work is liberating for lots of people. I don't understand how one, how you can say that. I mean, it's about Tracy and maybe yeah. other people can maybe have some kind of uh, empathy with that, but actually, in the end, it's all about Tracy, and it's incredibly selfish. But that, that's, that, that's within the small that's world of her, and her friends. It. I'm sure there's zillions of women in Britain that feel somehow a little bit encouraged and uh, supported through her work. I, mean, I don't know if I want her to be a role model. You know, I don't want if I, I don't know if I want my sister to grow up to want to be Tracy Emin. Why? No, but there's only one why? Tracy Emmy. Yeah, why? Yeah, why? What do you mean by that? Yeah, that's that's definitely true. That's such a weird true, thing to yeah. say. What do you mean by that? Why? Um, because I think that there's a lot of things that she's not going to have in her life that that it'd be nice if she did. Children, the, the obvious you've, things. Yeah, the things you've got in your life. So yeah, there again, okay. you're being very subjective, aren't you? She's, she's a kind of single person's artist, isn't Most she? Mostly, I agree with you. I've got a daughter, and I wouldn't like to think of her having to go through some of the things Tracy's gone through in her life. But then again, we all have to go through horrible things, don't we? This is all the cuttings that I've saved of Tracy's from a long time ago, and I just kept every one of them. Three or four hundred, maybe? Must be, actually. I was very proud of her because some of the lovely things were said about her, some of the not so nice things said about her. It says, I slept with all the good men in Margate and I don't regret it. And it says that there were 30 good men, but I don't really think there were 30 good men in Margate at that time. But no, I hated it, Tracy did as well, but there was nothing we could do about it once they'd put it in the paper like her tent when she all the people she ever slept with were people straight away imagine it's all the men but it isn't it was just through her life the people she'd actually been to bed with even Paul twins in the womb she slept with and her nan she plum she called it she slept with it was just everybody she slept with when she was nominated for the Turner Prize they didn't write something like Tracy Emin of Margate. They'd put, our Trace may be up, that's her, their words, our Trace, I've still got the paper, could be up for a mega prize. I was really surprised I was nominated for the Turner Prize this year because after being really drunk after the Turner Prize discussion panel thing, like is Peyton dead or whatever it was, I thought I'd just completely blown it anyway because I thought they're never going to let a girl like me Prance around the Tate, full view of cameras and live television ever again. Can I ask a Are really real people in England watching this program now? Are they really watching? Are they really watching it? Real people watching this program. Why are you asking that question? Mm. They're probably because as real as you are, Tracy. Let's face it. They're just 25 minutes behind us. Think about that. We were at the dinner at the Tate Gallery of the Turner Prize and uh, there was a kind of group of so-called distinguished people, including myself, uh, uh, sitting around. Tracy was also invited as a distinguished person, but she was a little bit drunk. She started taking the piss and uh, she became the star of the evening, and quite rightly too. I mean, the thing about art is talk about it less and look at it more. And I think that's what she was saying somehow. I'm the artist here from, from that show, from the station. I'm here, I'm drunk. I had a good night out with my friends, I'm leaving now. I'm going to be with my friends, I'm going to be with my mum. I'm going to phone her and she's going to be embarrassed about this conversation. It's live. But I don't care, I think you're a fuck about it. I was sitting quite comfortably watching the television and then suddenly I just turned it off. So I thought, that's, that's not Tracy, it can't be. And then, uh, I, uh, then I, think that, I think that next day she phoned me and I said, you know, don't worry, I'm saying, Tracy, that was awful. She says, don't worry about it, Mum. And then some, one of, somebody else rang me and said, don't worry about it. It's, you know, she didn't really do anything wrong. She was just saying what she thought. 
you people aren't relating to me now. You've lost me. Mm. You lost me completely. You, so you but don't, you don't think it is a generational I just, thing? Like, there's no way when this fucking mic on me. On, now, I want to fucking it off. I want to be free. Don't you understand? <clears throat> well, there's a great painting. Bye, there's a great painting of, of Turner Storms. Thanks. <laughs> My work is self-portraiture, definitely. So if I do a drawing of, a, say, a 13-year-old girl, it's actually a drawing of myself from my own memory of myself. But it doesn't necessarily look like me, um, but it's just the figure that I identify with. But it's almost like a fingerprint of myself or something. When I started drawing again after years of not drawing, I started by doing a series called Illustrations from Memory. So I, I thought of something which happened to me and then I illustrated it on paper. And that way I could justify myself in doing a drawing after so many years of not doing any. Well, I'd always really wanted to buy a, a piece of Tracy's. And to me, Tracy's always been a poet and a storyteller as much as she's been a, an artist and a painter and a drawer. Um, so I always wanted a piece which really told me something about Tracy's life and about Tracy herself. And uh, From a Week in Hell uh, was the first piece of Tracy's that I ever bought. Here we have a, um, a prose poem a depiction of her week. Friday, woke up having sex with a terrible hangover. Ran to the bathroom to throw up, shitting at the same time. Holding onto the pan, small white balls of foam cascading out of my mouth. My whole body shaking, my eyes ready to burst, swearing to God I'd never drink again. Threw up nine more times that day. Saturday and Sunday, spent the whole weekend in bed, depressed, trying to recover, while scabs break out all over my chin. Monday. Woke up with horrendous toothache, took some painkillers and dabbed on some oil of clothes. Went to pick up my pills too late and too late by two fucking hours for the morning after pill. Had to be fitted with an IUD, a piece of copper wire wrapped round a plastic hook. Tuesday, went to St Thomas's Hospital for lung scan test and chest medical. Was told I had emphysema a week in hell um, echoes of many experiences I've gone through in my life myself. But, uh, but I think it's for all of us. It's, um, it's, Tr Tracy gets really down in, into the depths of the soul. And I suppose the blankets are the closest things, really, that I get to like paintings, because you're dealing with textures and colours and tones, layering. But I think what's brilliant is that yeah, they actually do, from a distance, look quite pretty. And then when people get close up, they have to read the unbearable truth. When I was young, I had sex with someone. Oh, I was about 13, 14, 13, actually. And I had sex with someone on their way home, and their mate was with them, so their mate had to, like, sit behind a hedge or something. It was on a green in Margate. And when I stood up to pull my knickers up, one of them pointed and sort of said, yeah, look at that ugly c**t. They were actually talking about what was between my legs. And um, I just looked at them and thought, no, you've got it all wrong, you're the ugly c**t. Tracy's not secure, she's totally insecure, and, and, but, but by acting a certain way, you can, you can feel much better, and I think she, she knows that anyway. It's, it's the sort of ego side, of course, everybody's got an ego, but... I think it comes out much more with Tracy because she has got a lot more kind of insecurities about, about things in general. The first blanket that sold, I was actually really crying. And it was in New York and it had been on my bed for two days. And, and the day that it sold, I went to bed sort of like hot cuddling it. Thinking, well, what have I done? I've sold my blanket, I shouldn't have done it. And that blanket had, that blanket, a third of it was made from the blanket which I had on my bed when I was a little girl. And it also had a large piece of fabric on it from our sofa when I was four years old. 
And I think when you spend so long sewing something, all the blankets end up smelling, which is quite weird. Don't ask me what off, no. Of like, uh, like things being not of cigarettes or just of, or just of the life. And the tent had an exceptionally strong smell. Eating in it, you know, falling asleep in it, sweating in it. And of course, it uses the euphemism of sleep. And there are some people I've actually had sex with. A lot of the things seem too loose, too formless, for me to see them lasting in the sense of meaning anything to a future generation. The big exception I make, I, I could point to other things too, but it's the tent. It was as full of her life as it was of, of air. It was almost as though her life had inflated the tent to give it that, that rounded shape. Now, I've been talking about it as though it was some sort of great symbol, and that indeed is what it is. Tracy is a nomad, I think. I don't think she's a naturally rooted person. So the tent fits that very well. My dad's Turkish Cypriot. When I was a little girl, we used to, I used to speak Turkish up until I was four or whatever, and I just lost it when I went to school, the same as my twin brother, Paul. My dad took me to, to Cyprus and Turkey when I was um, 20, when I was in a quite bad, mentally quite a bad way. The idea was, I'm taking you home. Suddenly I realised that I had all this culture and all this side of me. And suddenly, to be back in this kind of um, Mediterranean environment, I realised just how un-British I was. And it was really good for me. But then as it went on, I've become more and more extreme. You can still see me with a dagger between my teeth and the long red fingernails, you know. I don't think I come across very English at all. She's got everything she needs. She's an artist and she don't look bad. She's got everything she needs. She's an artist. She don't look bad. She can take the dark out of the nighttime and paint the daytime black. She wears an Egyptian red ring. It sparkles before three. she speaks. Quickly, because the film's gonna run out. She's a hypnotist collector. Just you are a walking antique. Into the distance. You're coming back! All right, I've got Don't come back, Daddy! Just keep walking! Hey. Keep walking! I think you've ruined it. It's going to run out any second now. Right. Go. Keep going. Oh no! <laughs> oh sorry. No. Oh, oh, help me, I can't no, help you. No, come back and do it again. <laughs> I can't help me. Brilliant, excellent. It wasn't difficult, was it? I'm happy with that. Oh. Pete, yeah. Bow down to her on Sunday. Salute her when her birthday comes. Bow down to her on Sunday. Salute her when her birthday comes. No, that's all right. No, come on, no, no. I'm just... No, I'm not for Halloween, I'm give her a trumpet. And for Christmas, buy her a drum. I've been raised on gifts that my dad has promised me and promises that he's never been able to fulfil. Again and again and again. Tracy, I'll tell you something. No, not really. I'm not in the mood to surprise you. No. If you want this olive trees in this land, no, it's yours. No, this is not a surprise. I don't want to know about that. All I right, you. I don't okay. want that in the fucking programme. All right, take it off, that. take it off. No. Take so it I'm off. not interested in the remotest. It's impossible. I'm not having stuff like that. Not impossible, Daddy, sorry. Okay, my darling. All right. She's not materialistic, sir. <laughs> I'm used to promises from my dad that aren't kept, but now that I'm older, I kind of understand that it's part of... He's given me so much more, you know, that I, I, don't, I don't have a grudge with him against it. I just don't fall for it anymore like I used to, but I still behave in the same brattish way when he attempts to do it.
But you never know, maybe one day I'll come up trumps. But the important thing with me is I've done everything myself. So I don't suddenly don't want my dad to kind of like, you know, give me some golden plate or whatever. Because it's never been like that, ever. Do you ever regret not spending more time with me and Paul when we were little? Yes. When you weren't around, I was um, very vulnerable. There were times when things happened to me which I always felt that were really terribly wrong. Well, I didn't know that. Your mother never said anything. To me. Well, she, she didn't. Kept... She didn't know. And even if she did know, she would be in denial. She would be unaware. She, she would be oblivious to she it. She kept yeah. everything away from me. Looking back on your life, do you think it was wrong or right to have? Like a mistress and a wife for so long? No. 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 <laughs> I enjoyed every minute of it. Okay, then. But how many children have you got? Official. Official. Five. Five. How many unofficial? About eight. Mm, yes, about 18 of them. 18? Yeah. Now, the Plus last count, it was 11, about 10 years ago. No, we no, got no, no, no. 18? No. 18. And five? To you and three the others, five, yes, 23. 23 children? Yeah, that I know. That you know of? Yes. <laughs> no, that, that's true, but everybody was happy. <laughs> everybody was happy. And did you, um, you didn't plan to have me and Paul, did you? We no, in... we wanted it desperately. But we didn't know that it would be twins. But don't you think you were quite irresponsible for quite a lot of years when you went off? Well, I was drunk, <coughs> and, it, and it was, I was, the truth, I mean, m most of the time... Yeah, but I you weren't drunk when we were born, you become too tired Ah, oh, no, yes, ah, yes, because I, I gave up drinking when, when your mother told me that you, she was pregnant, okay. and it made, made me part of that, changed right. my life. Big, big question, do you think drinking, because Paul and I both drink quite heavily, which you and Mum seem mm. cool about, you don't yeah. seem to, you know, you've never given us any hassle or any trouble about it. But do you think that drinking could be hereditary, maybe? No. no, I don't believe that. It's you which you turn yourself into a habitual drinker. Do you think I'm more fun when I'm drunk or when yes. I'm sober? I'm more fun when I'm drunk. Yes, you are. I'm more joyful. Yeah. And do you think I'm just moody and um, irritable when I'm sober? Well, first thing in the morning, like this morning. Always you are like that. Tracy, I will never tell you what to do with your life, or drinking, or habit, or whatever you want to do, unless you realise yourself. You had all that freedom from childhood. Uskudara gider, ken aldı da bir yağmur. Uskudara gider, ken bir mendil buldum. Like the sea, we keep turning. Like time, life keeps moving, joined together by eternity, by blood, the stars, the sun and the moon. I love you, Daddy. Emin used to take me aside and give me advice about how to treat his princess occasionally, and I told Tracy that if he didn't stop, if she didn't stop him talking to me, I would have nothing to do with her. And she did stop him talking to me. He give, I think Emin gives misinformation, personally. I think there's a lot of, a lot of Tracy's blindness comes from Emin's blindness. When I first met her, she was studying fashion, and her work was, she did, she had a little sketchbook. She did interiors of her bedroom and maybe her nan, pictures at home. And she had a very low opinion of them, but I encouraged her that I thought it was good to do anything. It's all falling apart. She did when she went to Germany with her dad on a business trip. It's uh, instructions how to make your very own MTB because I wanted to live on a motor torpedo boat, so this is how you make one. She'd stopped doing fashion and she went to Maidstone to do printmaking. I've got one of the things, the first sexual things she did, which were pictures of me and her. When she was at Maidstone, she worked in the printmaking department and had a little corner of her own. And I think tutors there were a bit um, shamefaced about this particular corner because it was full of images that 
some people would rather not see. I mean, uh, you can see uh, the very sexually explicit images. And she was always tremendously uh, daring in her use of subject matter, um, very, very bold and following the German expressionist tradition, but using her own personal experience uh, as, uh, her, for her imagery. Everything I did between the age of, say, 19 and 22, 23 was like a gut reaction. It was like just one massive shit or one massive vomit. There wasn't actually much thought behind it. It was more like an imp impulse, like a kind of reaction. I would look at books on Edvard Munch or Kate Colwitz or Egon Schiller and then just run off and do my own versions. And then when I, then I did an MA at the Royal College of Art for two years doing painting, which was only painting, and I was a very unhappy student there. It was not a particularly good, conducive place for me. I went to see her after she left the Royal College when she had a studio in South London. And um, she was very ill and quite poverty-stricken and saw this um, among the pieces she had there. And it was quite different from anything I'd seen of hers before. I asked her if she wanted to sell it and what she wanted for it. And she wanted, she said um, she'd like 10 pounds. I knew that by any standards it was worth more than that, so I, I gave her 100 pounds. by a late developer in commercially being accepted as an artist or getting some respect. About two years ago, it worked out that I was going to probably a different country almost every week for art and for exhibitions and staying in really fantastic hotels like this one, you know, and always five star, except I was becoming unbearably lonely. I would just watch MTV, raid the minibar, drink the whole contents, write as many letters as I could on scraps of paper. So ultimately, in the end, my minibar bill or my fax and telephone bill would often be much more than the actual hotel room. So I got kind of sick at night. You know, I've always said, you know, what you do is just stay in your room and masturbate or something. You know, that is most people's options. Or alternatively, get out on the streets and start looking for it. I hadn't had sex for about a year or something. And it's uh, all I thought about, really. So it was kind of becoming a bit dangerous. So I decided to make a film about this kind of frustration. And then last year, me and boy George actually turned the words into a very nice disco song. of my body is bleeding a wound of desire and I know it's safer to be alone the kiss you left behind the sweet smell of desire after the Royal College I did actually destroy nearly all my work in 91 and this came about I think through my abortions I decided I didn't want to be like that anymore there was enough shit in the world and I really didn't need to put any more shit the fact that I was a failure as a painter, a failure as an artist, and then having an abortion gave me another level of failure as a human being. Middle of 1992, committed emotional suicide. Emotional suicide is killing yourself without dying, destroying each friendship and relationship one by one till I was alone. Destroyed all my art, left my studio, throw away my curtains, my carpet, my cushions, my comfort. Made my home into a cell and waited. I felt like I'd lost everything and everything was very difficult. And I was down in Margate and I wrote on the sea wall, I need art like I need God, and stood back, couldn't believe what I'd written. I hadn't even thought about it. It just was like a subconscious thing. And I thought about death, and I thought about despair, and all those kind of moments, were, and, and like when you lose lovers, and you, lose, you feel like life, you're losing grip of life. I ain't got 
And something good happens and you find your way again. And, and I thought about um, art, how many times I've left it and decided I don't want anything more to do with it. And it always finds me. 1992, asked people to invest in my creative potential. Met Sarah Lucas. January 1993, started the shop with Sarah. I think the shop was a good place to actually do all these bits and pieces, pieces because Tracy did do a lot of kind of ephemeral, um, small bits of work, and to actually have a place that would actually be able to you could actually see those. The context of the shop was quite good, and I think the idea of the shop was great anyway. And so I think obviously I think that did help Tracy's art as well, an awful lot. Hello, you're very warm. Yes, it's been correct. Yeah. <laughs> good morning, Mrs. Perry. <laughs> Your daughter's very hairy round the hole. Damn wrong! <laughs> I went to look around and I thought, God, this is hilarious, it's just all crap. And I came back downstairs, Tracy said, what do you think? Says, it's all crap. And she just sort of burst out laughing as though like I just got the point of the whole thing and, and I actually thought, yeah, I, I like this place. After the shop closed, it only was open for six months. Sarah went back to making art again and she had a kind of, you know, way of doing things. She had collectors, she had a gallery to work with, but Tracy had nothing. I first met Tracy in a pub. This very beguiling, wide-eyed girl came over. She asked, if, if you give me ten quid, I'll send you four letters over the next year. Sure enough, about two or three months later, when I'd completely forgotten the evening, a letter came through my uh, postbox and there was an account of a very difficult period in her life when she had her first abortion. And around that time, I invited Tracy to make an exhibition here in White Cube. So I said, why don't you try and make a, a kind of homage to your life? You must have the space, you can do whatever you like, but what, I, what really excites me about your work is the fact that you're sharing what is extraordinarily personal details. She devoted a section of the exhibition to photographs of every painting that she'd made from her days uh, at art school. She destroyed these paintings, but she photographed each and every one of them. And as a kind of homage to this earlier struggling period, she then went on to title the show, My Major Retrospective, I think believing that this might be the only opportunity she'd ever get to have an exhibition. Giles, the colour that we painted this wall has been chosen by Tracy, um, according to her instructions, based on the on the colour on this catalogue cover. I, what, I, um, what's the significance of that? It's her sort of trademark blue. So where is the work? The work, I believe, at this very moment, um, nearly half past five on Monday, the day before the show, is in Tracy's head. She's ill and um, I don't think she's had the opportunity to do the work. So uh, we know, I know her to be conscientious and reliable, therefore I expect her to be up all night. I'm sure, but with, there's still 24 hours is, is a pretty short space of time. Yes. Originally we were just going to have a sort of small drawing and text piece. I mean, it certainly wouldn't have covered that wall. I mean, how are we going to fill that? Well, how is she going to fill it? Do um, we know? No, we're not sure of the details. I imagine that Tracy is going to come with some drawings and text and that these will be placed strategically over the wall. All we need to do now is see it. Yeah. My exhibition at the White Cube is called My Major Retrospective. There was a wall of memorabilia, and I showed like a, a, a I called them families. Each piece had, was like a family, and one of them I think was was, was the most um, precious and the most seminal was my uncle Colin, which was mementos about my uncle Colin, and there was a text with it which explained his death, how he died in a car crash by becoming decapitated. Uh, a third-ton juggernaut lorry pushed his car underneath a bus 
uh, Chingford traffic lights. And the thing which uh, caught most people's, I think, imagination was a packet of Benson Hedges cigarettes that he was actually holding at the time of his death. I did think it was really wonderful. I just, because it, I felt that he was there, I felt that Colin was there when she'd made this work. Because at the time when Colin got killed, it did disrupt the whole of the family. And when she made this work, it just, we just felt that he was still here. Strange actually, isn't it? But it's how we felt about it. Mm. All artists have a backbone to what they do. So some people it could be photography, some people film, some people sculpture. And for me, the, the essence and the backbone of what I do is the written word, definitely. He slipped his arm around my shoulder and said, how about a New Year's Eve kiss then? We stood in the doorway of Burton's and started snogging. He put his hand down my top and at the same time pushing me against the wall, he pulled my skirt up and I began to worry. This isn't what I wanted. He was older than me, and everybody knew he'd broken into girls before, and I didn't want to be. No, I said, get off, please, no, you're hurting me. When it, the book was finished, I said, well, why don't we just drive across America and do a big, huge reading tour? And one day, Tracy said, you know, I'm gonna take my nan's chair with me which is sat in her flat for as long as I can ever remember, this funny old green chair. And she didn't, and I think what I'll do as well is I think I'll decorate it and sort of tell a few stories on it, make it into a piece of art. Her nan had said to her something many years ago, um, there's a lot of money in chairs. Meaning really that when you look behind chairs, you know, when you need to buy a few, you know, some fags or a bottle of beer or something, you can get some money out. This chair was probably worth four pounds, and now it's probably priceless. That's art for you. There's a lot of money in chairs. Tracy's work works as a kind of collage of different objects. And when you see it in the show, it's, I don't think seeing one piece in isolation works so much for me as to see a whole group of bits of Tracy's work need to have lots of other bits feeding off each other. I don't think that people really saw Tracy's work as a sort of cohesive thing until her solo show at the South London Gallery. You could actually see that there was something here which kind of connected up and there was quite a big story going on. Tracy and her twin Paul have gone their own separate ways, I think, but up until a certain point, they were very, very close. I'm proud of her, yeah. Don't get me wrong, like, anybody that's doing well, anybody that can sell an old bit of rope, like, and demand thousands of pounds worth of it, fair play to her, let her go for it. But is that art? Or is that somebody pulling the wool over somebody's eyes? That is my comment on modern art. It's a total load of bollocks. A sensitive letter about Paul's past was incorporated into one of her pieces of work and later on it appeared in a television program about collectors. So Paul's private life became public property. She's just literally out to shock and suddenly the wrong person watched that program and I lost my contract. I actually sit here, I've started my own life for seven years, being the good as gold, going to work every day, getting these contracts, takes one bit of snippet on TV and put one letter in a collage and suddenly I'm ruined. That's not fair, mate. The only way that I can actually see getting a positive result out of this was actually making this statement on television today to saying, please leave Paul Emin alone because he doesn't want nothing to do with Tracy Emin's artwork anymore. Previously, my family have actually helped me make a lot of my work with the memorabilia and all the objects and talking about them and stories. But I think a lot of time I make them cringe. It's OK for me living in London, this sort of metropolitan lifestyle, but it's not very good in Margate if people know all your private business from your past. I regret things. And sadly enough now, 
I'm, you know, I'm going to either change, my, my work is going to have to change, or I'm going to be censored, unfortunately, by my family. So if that's the way it is, that's the way it is. I have to respect people that I love. I was just thinking about when you used to jump off that thing. Yeah, it looks like a hundred foot away now, doesn't it? Yeah. Would you do it now? I might do if it was a sunny day, but... No, you wouldn't. No way. No way. No, no, way. no, way. no but it's no. Been a bit too cold for that. There ain't no steps here anymore, either. No, uh, everything's gone rusty and old. Yeah. And the skyline looks really stupid without the big wheel. Yeah. Mind you, we've got, it's like coming out here on the winter when all the storms are going. You used to get as close as the wall as you could and wait for a big wave and hang on to something. You're lucky we're not dead. Lucky we're not dead anyway. This really is mm. desolate. Yeah. No sun deck. We used to go swimming. Remember we used to go swimming yeah. off there as well? I'd light up a cigarette, but can I don't you, think... Can you still swim? Like... Yeah, I can still swim really brilliantly. I swim nearly every day now. Not every day, about four times a week. I swim in the swimming pool. I swim um, about a, a like a kilometre a time. Do you want to try and dive one of these or not? No, I've got a knob light. To be a, a good artist or to, or to be respected, it doesn't mean to say that you have to be all worthy, lock yourself in your garrison, wear dungarees, you know, wear your workman's boots, have your brushes in your pocket and kind of um, look forward to your one-man solo show every two years. It isn't like that being an artist anymore because I think the role of the artist as we go into the next millennium is definitely to be a communicator of different mediums and different ideas. So this is GLR 94.9 and Gideon Co. with you till 6. As of today, the Blue Gallery on Walton Street is hosting Temple of Diana, which comprises various artworks on the subject of the late Diana, Princess of Wales, and it includes the uh, work of Tracy Eamon, who uh, joins me now. How are you doing? All right. Now then, uh, the uh, subject you were given was Diana, Princess of Wales. What have you actually come up with? I've actually come up with a handful of what could be considered quite scrappy, fresh kind of naive looking drawings. My usual kind of thing. But I wish I'd have spent longer doing the drawings, maybe made a lot more. So what does Diana bring to mind for you then? Well, I really hate the royal family and think that they should have been like either shot a long time ago or at least been made to give up all their money until Diana. And I kind of quite like the way that she almost brought them down single-handedly. And I see her as quite a good modern icon. It's pretty difficult for me to do drawings about someone else and not me, I must. But I did have lots of ideas. Uh, they're very moving. Thank you very much, Tracy. They're quite sentimental, yeah, I they're, think. They're yeah, they go straight to the... There's absolutely nothing cynical about it whatsoever. About five years down the line, what would you like to be doing? I'd like to be living in a really big sort of house by the sea with a nice swimming pool in the back garden, sunbathing. Making what though? Doing the same as what I'm doing now, but in a nice environment. Tracy's got this idea that you don't need to be a starving artist in a garret to make art, but the tent, neon signs, her book, um, her blankets, her drawings, everything. It all came from being in a position of having no money and buying bottles of cheap brandy. The calendar's for a car company, Daewoo, and they've asked certain artists and people to do a month. My month is October, which is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Yeah, it was my idea, yeah. Yeah, just to have my tits in it, really. So it's a car effort, and it's a car calendar. Where's it going to be hung? Garages, you know. What do are, what are these men in garages want to see, these mechanics? I don't want to look like a hunchback, exactly. And I don't want to look hangdog. I want to have some kind of dignity about this whole situation. She has called herself Mad Tracy from Margate. 
But now I think that Tracy would prefer to see herself as sensible, sane Tracy from Shoreditch. What the hell's selling out? The idea of making the same thing again and again and again, it would kill me. I really do. I need to get some more felt. I'm just going to pop downstairs and get that. You don't have to follow me. Even with each blanket, each blanket would be very different. I've got this white felt because I'm going to make a blanket. There's a story about me wetting the bed in Austria. I'm actually going to sew the white uh, felt onto a stained pissy sheet. So I'm really looking forward to that one, but obviously I need a lot of white felt because all the text is just going to be white and it's just going to tell the story of me wet in the bed. And then every day tearing up the sheet into tiny pieces and burying it in the snow. Hence that's why I want everything to be white and yellow. So I'm going to just get, have to get a sheet and then just piss all over it. So, But unartistically, I just want to be natural and I'll probably do it laying down because if you stand up it will go like a, it will actually make a pattern, wouldn't it? Let's get this right. You like her because you think she's a new type of artist for the 90s, is that right? I think she's a person who's successfully made herself into a larger-than-life character. At the moment, there's such an elastic idea about what art is that she can make herself seem like a thing called a conceptual artist. No one knows what that is, but yeah. she seems to have made herself into one. Do you trust her? Do you believe that it's coming from the heart rather than from some kind of position of knowledge that people reading or watching this will be moved by it or titillated by it? Yeah, that's a good question. Because I'm not sure what it is. I believe something about what she's doing. I'm not sure if I believe that her pain is any more important than anyone else's. That's what I meant, yeah. Yeah, no, I think she is the same as anyone else. She's the kind of over every woman in that sense. But That's her, what makes her a good artist, isn't it? Because yeah, it's a she construct. can access something that people want to know. She's, people can identify with She's it, used yeah. real things. She puts them but together. she turns them into yeah. something. Yeah, yeah that that's why real. it's art, and it's not a bore in a pub, you know, yes. crying into their beer and telling you about their problems. That's right. Yeah. Unlike us two. Yeah, it's old farts. Yeah. Everyone has their cross to bear, and it doesn't matter how much pain I've been in my life, when I actually really balance it up, um, I haven't really suffered that much. But saying that, I think I would still give up all the art today at this instant, not to have the, the sort of volatile emotional feelings that I've had or had to go through. And it's the fact that I've used them to make work, I've turned it around, I've turned the bad things around to make something good, rather than just saying, oh, life's terrible, you know, I'm destroyed. I've just turned it all around. She's born to win the Turner Prize. She's born to be a dame. You know, when she's 55, she will be a dame. She's born to be on stage, and I'm sure she's in pain whenever she's not on the stage. And when she's on stage, she's acting the pain. And uh, so if she got the prize, she would uh, make a fabulously drunken speech of thanks and forget everyone's name and get the names back to France. Sorry, gentlemen, I'm afraid you've been asked to leave the establishment. Do you mind if I you remove your drinks? I'm just the barmaid, OK? I just work here. Well, I'm sure we deserve to be chucked out. There's nothing worse than warm men with warm beer. Tracy, they've got one bottle each you can chug. Right up there. One up there. <laughs> She'll come.